Hello! So today we are doing a quick flight from Hanover down to Stuttgart in Germany in the uh, Airbus A330 in Microsoft Flight Simulator. So this is the headwind Airbus that's recently been updated. So a few people have asked me if I might take a look at it because it has changed and there's lots of new functionality. We're not going to delve into the new functionality today. We're just going to see if the airplane is stable and can fly a flight plan. So we are inside the Airbus. First thing we do is press Control and 8 to look overhead and we go and turn the batteries on. And because we are out on a parking area in the airfield, we do not have external power. So we just have to go and turn on the APU straight away. And that will obviously power itself up. While we're waiting for the APU, we can go and turn the strobes to auto. We can turn nav and logo to two. And we can go to the oxygen. Oh, we can't yet, we have to wait. So let's come down here then and wait for the APU to come up to speed. If we look around the back of the aeroplane, you'll actually hear it coming to life. So you can see the hot air pouring out there. So in a few seconds, the screens will um, boot up throughout the aircraft and the systems will come online as soon as the APU is generating power, basically. So just give it a few seconds. So I'm very much following a functional procedure to get the aircraft up and running. I am not doing checks and balances of fire tests and things like that. I'm literally just doing the absolute minimum things to get the aeroplane up and going. Okay, so while we're waiting for this all to boot up, let's go and brighten some screens up. It looks like they're fairly bright actually, that's interesting. So I was playing with this a few minutes ago and brightened the screens up when I first looked at it and it would appear that it has remembered the brightness levels when doing a restart of the flight ready to record. I was just making sure controllers and things were configured. Okay, so um, what you can do, and this will just reflect that the APU is running, if you're on the ECAM buttons down here, if you press the APU button, the status of the APU will come up on this screen. Obviously that's just showing it's running, but we know it's running because we have power to all the systems throughout the aircraft. So the next thing we do is go control eight and we can turn the nav or the ADIAS system to nav across the three sensors. So obviously now we have the APU running, we have power for that to happen. We can also turn on that air, uh, crew supply for the air. On the sign section, we can turn the emergency exit light to armed and we can turn a no smoking to auto. Okay, so then we've done the brightnesses then in the cockpit, so we can press Control and 5 and go to the MCDU. So it's saying select desired system, so we can clear that message. Now it's saying GPS is using primary, which is fine. Now interestingly, I have not updated the 330 with Navigraph. I'm not sure if I have to or not. So let's actually, while we're here, let's go and open Navigraph and see what it says about that. So if we go to the Navigraph hub, I guess it is. I've changed the name of it recently, haven't they? Uh, so apparently not. The fly-by-wire is not listed here as an... So it must be using the data from the simulator. Having said that, look, the 3000, 5000 requires an update, which we're not going to do. OK, so we go to the the flight management computer itself. And it boots up, and here it comes. And we go to init, and we put in where we're going from and to. So we're going from EDDV, which is Hanover, to EDDS, which is Stuttgart. So echo, delta, delta, victor, slash, echo, delta, delta, Sierra. And we drop those into the field and come back, and that's programmed. We put a flight number in, we'll put in any old flight number, because we're making this flight up just to functionally test the aeroplane, really. Flight number is in use. A, A, B, B. We really don't mind what's in there. Passenger number. Uh, we got no passengers. <laughs> 100 is the cost index. Uh, cruise flight level 360. That should calculate temperature, and it does so. And then we can go sideways and we can go and pre-calculate our zero fuel weight and we can put in our block fuel which is 15.8 okay and that calculates all the numbers for us then 
and then we can carry on sideways and it's all looking fine so then we can go into the flight plan actually let's go into performance first before we do the flight plan um we need oh actually no we do need to do flight plan without knowing which runway we're on although it should still work let's try this we'll put one into flaps for setting number one for takeoff we're not going to use flex temp we're going to put in let's have a look on navigra find out what the transition altitude is in this area so it's 5,000 feet. So this just helps the aircraft know where it can um, change, you know, the phases of flight to do things. So V1, we should be able to recalculate these now. Now we've got the flaps in, yeah. So it's not dependent on the runway, it's just dependent on the flap setting with what the V-speeds are going to be and obviously the weights we've already put into the, the initialization pages. So then there are no other pages here. We can go to next phase though. We can step through the phases of flight for the performance. Uh, we're not going to change the climb. We're not going to change cruise. We're not going to change descent. We are going to put Q and H at the approach. Um, can we find that out easily from Navigraph? This is a good question. EDDF, we get information up on the airfield. We can say open the airport and show us the weather and we can say that it's 1021 at the destination obviously it may have changed slightly by the time we get there but in the normal procedure you'd be checking this on approach and you know checking the wind and all that kind of stuff we're going to leave most of this out so go to our flight plan page now echo delta delta victor we are going to be doing the wera 3g from runway 9r so back in the airplane we select the departure airfield departure 9 right and the Wera 3G so we scroll through Wera 3G there's the standard instrument departure so we've got those chosen now and we can insert and that's given us the plan at the bottom we get the destination so we can click at the destination and say what arrival we are doing and we're going to be doing the Geben 1W onto runway 25 with the ILS. So it's ILS for runway 25 and Geben 1W. And insert it. So then we can have a scroll through the flight plan and see if we've got any discontinuities. Doesn't look like we have. It all looks good. Okay. So if we click flight plan page again, it just brings us back to the top of the page ready to go, basically. So we've got the the um, flight plan programmed in. So on the MCP, we can, should be able to press control two. There we go. We get the master control panel for the um, the flight computer or sorry, the autopilot. It's not called the MCP, though, is it in the Airbus? Is this MG something? I can't remember off the top of my head. FMGC maybe uh, anyway so we're going to um, set our altitude so we'll go straight for 36,000 feet so we're going to use managed altitude to get there so the airplane will just fly us up to this level uh, on a real departure the controller would give you an initial climb altitude to get out of the airspace and then departures would take over and let take you up to your cruise altitude but we're not going to do that today we're going to keep everything simple so we're not having to deal with ATC so we're pushing all of these knobs to put everything on managed mode okay so the flight directors are on we can press B to shortcut the QNH for the departure airfield we can switch this over to hectopascals because we're in Europe or we should be able to oh the sims frozen just give it a second Today would be good. There it goes. So we'll switch over to hectopascals on the QNH. Okay, so overhead panels, seatbelts go to on. Uh, where's the seatbelt sign? There it is. External power goes to off if used. It wasn't. We do the pushback at this point. We don't need to do a pushback. We are on the apron. Then we press end and then so I'll make sure the parking brake is on it is on on my controller uh, engine start so beacon light goes to on 
which is somewhere here. There it is. Fuel Five pumps. Arm doors and cross Fuel pumps go to one. The APU bleed goes to on. It's down here. And then we busy ourselves with actually starting the engines. So in the Airbus, I'm going to do this with my controller. We turn this knob down here to start. That's the ignition system. And then we move the starters for the engines. So your engine number two is coming up. And if we look up here, you will see the N3, as they call it now, is coming up on engine number two. And it will continue on straight through in the Airbus. You don't have to do anything special to get the air aircraft up and running. It's all automated. So we'll wait for that engine to come up to speed, to stabilise, and then we'll start the other engine. Just give it a few moments. Should we brighten this up a little bit? It's looking good. Okay, let's start the other engine. So looking down, I'm going to do this on my controller. So we're going to flick the switch forwards. And engine number one is coming up to speed. So you can see it's coming up through the end of the APU, spinning it up, and then it ignites. Exhaust gas temperature will start rising, and then the turbo fan will start spinning. So if you're not aware how turbo fans work, it's kind of like a windmill. The, the gas from the gas turbine, which is in the middle of the engine, if we have a look outside. So the gas from the gas turbine, which is that part in the middle of the engine, pushes a... Uh, if you imagine the big fan at the front is connected to a smaller fan at the back so the hot air coming out of the back of the gas turbine drives the small fan which has an axle directly to the the big fan so it's kind of a windmill the jet engine is spinning the windmill which is a free free rolling you know um construction it's very clever it's very simple okay so engines are up and running so now they're up and running, we can turn the ignition system back to off, or norm. Um, we can... Uh, I'm going to stick to the checklist, otherwise I'll miss things out. So control and 8, we go and turn the APU bleed back off. So, oh that's the APU I've turned off there, but it doesn't really matter. APU comes off, and then the APU... Uh, sorry, APU bleed comes off, and then the APU. So then... Taxi! We can taxi now, so while we are taxiing, we'll come off the parking brake. Actually, before we do that, let's just have a little look at the map. See where we are. So we are taxiing straight out onto the runway. So we'll do a right turn as we go out onto the taxiway here. So off the parking brake. So we are going to arm the ground spoilers. We are going to also go and set the um, wind shear or predictive wind shear now is the aircraft actually rolling yet do we have to give it some positive thrust should, oh, should we turn the tablet on while we're at it just before we get rolling let's go and do this so i have programmed our flight into simbrief as well the one we've just done into the um, system so you can see exactly the same plan there and that will obviously go and fetch us our data information as well we, can, we have got Navigraph um, integration, which we're not going to look at just yet. We'll do that while we're in flight, I guess. Um, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. What are we looking at? So, flaps to take off position and get rolling, I guess. So I'm going to push the engines gently forwards and we're rolling. We have nose wheel steering, which is good. It's warning us on the system that TCAS is on standby, but normally you wouldn't arm that until you are on the runway and it's saying APU is still available it takes it a while to disappear so you have to remember this is a big old heavy plane 
so it doesn't um, you can't easily throw it around on the taxiways also you have to remember that the nose gear is driven by powerful servos so there is a massive lag from you commanding a direction on the nose wheel and it happening because it has to rotate So there's no hurrying anything with taxiing these big aeroplanes around. Also you tend to need to lead corners with the nose because it's a big long body. So you'll be hanging the nose out over the corner thinking in terms of the body behind you being on the line. Hopefully that makes some sense. So let's just check flap condition or flap position is looking good. So again, I've straightened up on the nose wheel there a few seconds ago. It took it a while for it to unwind itself. We want all the runway we can get, because there's a big old heavy lump. OK. So it throttles all the way forwards. We'll do TCAS on the climb out. We're not in a massive hurry. The other thing you might... Well, well I'll, I'll do it once we're in the air. We should have had landing lights on, really. So here we go. We're going a bit fast, but it's fine. So autopilot can come on. Climbs go back to the climb to tent, sorry, throttles go to the climb to tent, and flaps can come up. We go and sort out those lights that we were talking about a moment ago. So this has changed slightly from the A320. Um, nose doesn't have to be on. We're looking good. So at this point, we go and turn TCAS on, which is over here somewhere. So again, this has changed. We want it on TARA. The exact procedures you follow are, are often different in terms of you know what, what modes you put things into and how you arm them. They're often different from airline to airline. So it's saying now of TCAS standby. So it may be doing that automatically. Well, unless it hasn't, it, where it was shining in the light there. Oh yeah, there we go. Yeah, I need to put it onto auto mode. So TCAS will come on and we get the dotted lines around the aircraft and the, the little uh, dashes are in the aircraft, which if another aircraft comes within that circle, it will alert us. So let's zoom out slightly, so you can see there's another aircraft over there. Okay, so the plane, if we go and look at the, there's no real restrictions on this route, look, so we can climb straight out. If we go and look further through the route, we may well see, yeah, there's some restrictions on the way back in, going to 10,000 feet and then down to 5,000 feet. So if you remember, our transition altitude was 5,000, so the QNH is flashing to remind us to go to standard QNH now. So we will pull the QNH knob and it goes to standard. So our next marker is going to be going through 10,000 feet to accelerate. and the landing lights can come off as we get to 10,000 feet as well. So let's just keep an eye on the altitude there. So, so far this is all remarkably straightforward. So 9,700 feet, 98, 99, and landing lights off. And you can see the acceleration marker has increased now because once you're above 10,000 feet you don't have to stay at 250 knots or below. So seatbelt light is still on. To be honest now we're on the climb out we could let the passengers up. Normally you wouldn't until you're at top of climb but we're going to 
expedite that, let the ca passengers go and wander about, go to the toilet. It always amuses me on real flights that the, um, oh, while we're here, let's just clear that. There we go. It always amuses me on real flights that immediately the light goes off, you get a few people charged down to the bathroom. Okay, so airplanes up and running. I've always liked the Star Alliance colours. I've been on several of the Star Alliance aircraft when I've been flying around Europe with work. They do look nice. Okay. So there's not going to be much to see or do for the next few minutes, so I may pause the live stream um, until we get a bit further on. So that's the Simbrief plan that we translated into the aircraft. I guess... Okay, this wants to do a Navigraph authentication. Let's see if I can do that on my mobile phone while we're here. Now we're not in a hurry. Uh, Navigraph. Have I got it installed on my phone? I thought I did. Maybe I don't. Okay, but we can put the code in. Navigraph.com slash code. So if we go to Navigraph dot com slash code and we put in the code first of all it's going to ask us to log in or we'll log in as me to a b t w r e 2 anybody that thinks i'm giving away anything secure here no i'm not this is a a one-time use code so it's been used now so allow that into my account to allow this particular request, I should say. And there we go, we've now got the Navigraph charts on our route, so we should, if we look at the route, we haven't got any pinned charts. Okay, so what you'd have to do is come in here and actually pin them. So when you look at the flight, for example, and we're looking at this chart here, Can we save the whole group? Uh, what should we call it? EDDV EDDS Create So then if we come back in here Well maybe it's not, oh maybe it only means within the simulator So we could go EDDV and We could look at the SIDS and we were doing the... Now, which one was it? So a quick look. Wera 3F. Which looks like that. Wera 3F, there it is. So this is what it meant by pinned. If you pin one here, you get it to look at. And you don't have to have this in night mode, by the way. This is one of the new fancy dandy tricks that Novograph has up its sleeve, that you can uh, play games with that. So obviously we can we can move around in the cockpit if we want to get a bit closer to the tablet. And then you get to see it within the sim, which is cool. There's our little aeroplane travelling along on its way out of the standard instrument departure. So yeah, if you've not seen Navigraph before in action within the simulator, it's very useful. It is a nice to have, it's not absolutely essential. And to be honest, little nav map can do pretty much everything it can do, just without the official looking charts. Well, I guess where the charts are really valuable is if you are studying to become a pilot, then becoming familiar with them, how they look and where the information is could be invaluable to you. But it's just an extra bit of um, immersion if you're using a simulator. Okay, what else do we get then in here? So this is the same as it was with getting the operational flight plan from Simbrief. 
we had some options when we were on the ground to manipulate the services and things like wheel chocks and cones. Um, some cal nice calculators in here, that's useful. Good to have for descent and landing. So navigation and charts, again this is showing the Navigraph interface. So air traffic control. So if you were using VATSIM, I guess it would give you shortcuts to the frequencies. So we've got various failures that we can simulate, we're not going to. Various checklists for going around the aircraft doing things, which is quite cool. And interior lighting presets. Interesting. Anyway, so we are en route. We're just coming up to Wera, which was the end of our standard instrument departure, I guess. Yeah. And then we're into the cruise portion of the flight. So top of descent is being marked in as 100 miles out from the destination, but that's the A3 A320. So we probably need to descend a little bit earlier than that. We'll see. I might have to use spoilers if I come down that late, because it's basically a straight in into Stuttgart. There's no messing around in the standard approach route. But yeah, so far it's so far so good. It's it all just seems to work. It's very familiar. I'm, I have no doubt that there is tons of extra functionality hidden away in the um, A cars, in Atsu. So let's have a look. Has AOC got the same kind of stuff it's always had? So you've got weather requests, you've got message sending. So let's do a weather request just to try it out. So we've got the two airports. We click send, that does message sent. We should get a message up here that we've got a company message in a moment. So it takes a little while for that to happen usually. Just have a check round while we're doing that. The throttles are on the climb detent. The TCAS is on. So have we got the message yet? Just keep an eye on these screens. There we go, company message. So if we come back out of here and we look in received messages, we can see there's the meta. And if we want, we should be able to print it. And if we keep an eye on the printer, out comes the printout. The sun is shining on it so brightly we can't read it. Let's give it a moment. And then if we click on that and it sticks it... Oh, where's it stuck it? They've put it somewhere different now. Ah, oh, they've moved it over here. So you've got the printout of the weather. So you can see there you've got the QNH at the destination 1019. It's good to know. OK, so I'm going to pause the recording at this point so you don't have to sit waiting for the next 20 minutes for us to get to top of descent. So I will see you in a moment. OK, so we have unpaused. and Let's just have a quick look at where we are on the map. We're approaching top of descent as it would have been in the A320, but we're going to do it a little bit earlier. So we're going to say to the aircraft, please come back down to 10,000 feet. So we can do that, remember, at speed. In fact, this would be interesting to see if we use managed mode to see it take care of doing everything on its own. So let's go and double check on the, um, the details of the airfield. So on the overview of Stuttgart, it's at 1,200 feet. 1258 feet above sea level. So we need to be two and a half thousand feet above airfield elevation at the beginning of the. Yeah, as the pilot's now talking to the cabin in the background. So we need to be two and a half thousand feet above airfield elevation. So two and a half, so that's 3750 feet. So we'll go for 4000 as our target. Um, press into the aircraft again just to reprogram that. So we're descending to 4,000 feet. It will level out 
to get rid of the speed on its own probably at 10,000 feet. It'd be interesting to see how it manages that. Or if it even is going to be able to make it in time. So we'll pull the zoom out. So we're showing an 80 mile range here. Let's have a look at some of the options we've got on the system. So if we click in the cog in here, we've got some op lots and lots of options. So if you go to sim options, we've got realism so we could do keyboard input that's interesting so you can have keyboard input on the do if you want sync efis controls between captain and first officer so again that's off which is normal uh, show pilot avatars just come back out third-party options, so is GSX integration is built in. So we've got the, the Meta source, it's getting it from Meteor Blue, which is the source of the simulator, which is good. Uh, automatically import some brief data is no. Error reporting, yes. Telex, copy enabled. Simbrief, ah, so there's my Simbrief ID. That's why it was able to pull the Simbrief information earlier. Interesting. So how we do in terms of descent, let's see what we're down. 26,000 feet and we're now within 80 miles. Or, well, once you straighten this out, we're still beyond 80 miles from the runway, but we're not coming down tremendously quickly. So to expedite that, if we wanted to, we just pull the spoilers out. And you can see that increases the rate of descent enormously. You quite often see this on commercial flights where they just creep out the spoilers to it to um, descend more quickly. It's, it's interesting. Whenever I've flown, I typically, if I get to choose a seat, I will see, sit somewhere back here so I can watch the wing and see what's happening with the various phases of flight and you know exactly what they're doing by watching the air brakes or the spoilers I should say it's a really nicely modelled aeroplane isn't it they've done a good job on it and it's got lo loads of wing flex going on very cool ok so we're coming down obviously a bit more quickly now Twenty thousand feet. So you can see it's got an artificial target of ten thousand feet, at which point it will level out to get rid of the speed. So we're about 60 miles out now, or 65-ish, 70. Once you straighten this line out, obviously it's way out here somewhere. So let's come off those spoilers. So 60 miles out, coming down to 15,000 feet. Let's go and have a look at the... Um, if we go and look at Navigraph. And let's go and look at the approach plate. So it wants us, yeah, 10,000 feet for Gebno. Well, above, sorry, above 10,000 feet for Gebno. The reason for that, which isn't immediately obvious on the Navigraph chart, is if you look at Stuttgart and you zoom out, 
we've got 4,000, 4,500, 10,000. Oh, actually, sorry, I'm confusing myself now. I almost did this flight somewhere else, and there was a range of hills near the approach, but there isn't here, so this is just to do with avoiding other corridors, probably. So you can see the aeroplane's coming in now towards Gebno, so we want to be 10,000 feet for Gebno. We're above 10,000, we're just coming down to 11,800. So we can chop the range down on this to 40 miles. So we're 20 miles out from Gevno. We're going to be at 10,000 feet at Gevno perfectly. So you can see that restriction is there. And then we've got 5,000 feet at DS552. And then you've got some speed restrictions as well kicking in. So to make a huge change this time, something I don't normally do, we are going to do this on full approach auto land you know everything on and let the airplane do everything on its own just to kind of see what it can do really so we'll configure the plane up when we get a bit close to the destination for auto land it's quite straightforward in the airbus So you can see, look, the speed has changed. And the altitude restriction has come into place. 10,000 feet. So now we are at 10,000. We are going to go and put the landing lights on. Okay, so as soon as we get through Gebno, the aircraft should start descending again. So we'll have a look around. This weather looks quite interesting with the live clouds. So thankfully we are doing an instrument approach with, on, you know, with all the toys being used just to see how it behaves really. So I know lots of people are interested in the automated systems. Personally, I hate them. I would much rather fly an aeroplane myself, and that's where you usually see me kick out the autopilot as soon as you're anywhere near approach, fly it in myself. Quite often I end up flying SIDS and STARS myself as well these days, just to um, keep the skills going. I think it's a bit of a shame if you don't do it yourself. <laughs> Okay, so let's see what's happening. I've not, not touched the joystick, it has to be said, since I pulled back at takeoff. I really have not touched it. Not touched the throttles either. Put them on um, the climb detent, yeah, the climb detent on climb out. Not touched them since, so really I've just been clicking buttons in the cockpit for the whole flight. In my mind, this is not flying. This is controlling a computer. Okay, we have started the next phase of the descent automatically. It will decelerate to 210 knots. Let's go and check the standard approach route chart. So, what have we got here? 5,000 feet at DS552. 
So we're just coming through. Gebno was there at flight level 100, and then we come down. Now there were speed restrictions, but I can't see them clear. Oh, here we go. So that's just a, I think that's just a performance consideration for the deceleration it was showing within the MCDU. So where it's got 210 knots at DS512, that doesn't look like that's actually on the chart. It might, oh, I suppose it might be in here. Nope. So it hasn't given us the ILS charts. So let's go and find the charts for, oh, maybe we can get it from here. Yeah, it just hasn't selected it. So ILS, runway 25, add to route. And then we have got the ILS chart name. So we can zoom in on this and have a look at it. So has it got the speed? DS 512, 4,000 feet. Um, blah, 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 blah. I'm just having a read. There's nothing obvious about it, about a speed restriction. Straight in landings. No, there's nothing obvious about ground speeds, ILS, yeah, it's all fairly standard stuff on the chart there. Okay, let's go and keep it on the aeroplane, make sure it does this properly. So we're down to 5,000 feet, the speed hasn't come off yet. So we don't do the 210 knots until DS512. which we're just approaching, but we could, if we wanted to, go and put the wheels down, I suppose. We came down to 10,000 feet, we haven't put the landing lights back on. Oh, we have. I did do that, sorry. So notice I put a target in at 4,000 feet, it's holding us at 5,000 feet. So let's go and double check. The ILS frequency is 109.9, 252 degrees. So if we go and look on the radio navigation here, 109.9, 252 degrees. It's all pre-programmed because we put it in the flight plan. So it knows all about it. We don't have to tune in the ILS as we do in the Boeings. It's all done for us. OK, let's go and set the range on these so we can see them. So we will, when we make the final turn, switch this over to landing system mode. We'll also go and switch on both ILSs and you will see the symbology change at the top of the, uh, the primary flight display. So when you are engaged on the ILS frequency, you can engage both autopilots at once, which normally wouldn't work. On approach it does work. So it's complaining because we're at 5,000 feet about the QNH, so we'll go and do that. So we're going to go and program it ourselves. So I think it was, uh, what did we say, 1021. Let's just double check that. Weather at Stuttgart. Oh, so 1019. So we'll just spin that round. There we go. So we've set the QNH, so calibrated the altimeter accurately. OK, so we're approaching the turn. Let's zoom in on this a little bit so we can see the... There's the airfield. We're approaching the final turn. We should pick up the beacon fairly soon for the ILS. Or not the beacon, the signal for the ILS. And the aircraft is decelerating. You can hear the same difference in the engines. So it's, it's decelerating down, if you remember, to so 210 knots, or it's trying to. So yeah, the speed's falling off actually quite quickly. I'm su surprised with that. Let's see how it's doing it. It's not using spoilers on its own, is it? No, it wouldn't. It's a very pretty day. 
Okay. So we are down to an appropriate speed. I'm going to start feeding the flaps in. As soon as we've made the turn, we'll drop the gear down as well. So it's decelerating further. So we'll descend, we'll drop the flaps further, which will help it decelerate, to be honest. So it may go steeper because it won't accelerate in the descent. You can see the airfield out there now. There's an interesting feature here. There's two very tall buildings right in the flight path. It's quite dangerous, isn't it? Okay, so you should see the flight director zoom off to the right anytime soon as it goes for the turn. And there it goes. So let's turn this screen over now to show the landing system. So there's the direction of the runway relative to us. There's the glide slope. So we are at this point going to say approach please and turn on both autopilots. We'll also put the gear down. We've still already slowed down enough that we can drop the flaps further. So we're full flaps now, gear is down, landing lights are on, and we can also go and program the auto brakes to a max, or we should be able to. I appear to have no auto brake system, which is interesting. Well, I can go for medium on the auto brake, okay. Yeah, look at that. Those chimneys are right on the flight path. Or they're probably not chimneys, they're probably skyscrapers, but imagine sitting on top of them, taking pictures of the aeroplanes going in. 2,500. So here we go. So you'll notice at the moment we're at my target altitude of 4,000. So it was about 3,750 we really wanted. But then, if you notice, as soon as we cross into the ILS beam, so you have to come into an ILS beam from beneath it. The vertical speed will drop, the nose will go down. So watch it carefully. 2,500. And you can see the nose dipping. So there we go, it's chasing the ILS now and it's, it's got the right angle. And it's descending. So let's have a look outside at that. So we're fully configured now for landing. Gear is down. It's a gorgeous aeroplane, isn't it? The lights are on. It's managing speed completely automatically. It's managing descent rate automatically. So it might be fun just for a change, seeing as this is on fully automatic, to watch it from outside. Yeah, you can see those buildings now. Look, they're quite tall buildings, actually. If we look down on them, I wonder how accurate this all is. It looks quite good, doesn't it? It's obviously a real place. It's a wonderful view from the towers, though, of the approaches in Stuttgart, isn't it? Of course, because the sim has drawn them like this doesn't mean they're actually what they look like. That could well be um, chimneys in the real world. Here comes Stuttgart. Okay, so as promised, I'm going to leave it outside. On the outside view, let's get a nice view of this happening. Makes a change, doesn't it, to sit and watch the landing. As soon as we touch the ground, I'll have to jump inside the aeroplane and help. And there's a fair bit of turbulence kicking around. Let's see how good a job it does.
I might move the camera around a little bit so as we get near the runway to actually see the touchdown. It's stuttering a little bit. I think it's yeah, it's loading assets on the ground. It's causing the sim to stutter quite badly. as we trust. <laughs> oh, it got that massively wrong look. That was a, that was fascinating. Retard. So, reverses. And brakes. And spoilers. How quickly can we stop? Let's come off the brakes. Come off the reverses. Stops pretty quickly, actually. So, yeah, the landing was terrible. That's what you get for letting a computer land an aeroplane, and that's why I almost never use auto land. That was awful. We wiped out pretty much all of the approach lights. And this isn't some custom scenery, this is the built-in scenery, so... Sorry, the guys that are working on the A330, you've got some work to do there, I think. But this is why I, I land them myself, usually, because that was awful. If I'd done it myself, it would have come in visually, you know, because we had perfect visibility today. It would not have been an issue, and that's why you shouldn't use Autoland. It's, a, it's an avenue of absolute last resort. Okay, so TCAS can come back off. And we're going to leave the aeroplane at this end of the airfield, which is all very convenient, isn't it? put it on the parking here. So on the run-in you would normally go and switch on the APU. Oh, we've um, got to stop the aeroplane back. So right here and get in everyone's way completely unapologetically okay so what you would normally do at this point is wait for the APU to come up sitting on the parking brake turn all the lights off for obviously because you should have done that on the taxi in to be honest um, you're looking for the strobes which is here turn them back off and as soon as you have APU back up and running which we're just waiting for remember it took a few moments when we got in the aircraft earlier if you read about different procedures different airlines some of them let them fire it up in the air some of them don't it's an interesting one so we're just waiting why is it not coming on did I not switch it on Oh, I didn't press the start button. Oh, genius. I'd be, if I had a brain, I'd be dangerous. So we just wait for the APU to come on now. We've actually told it to start. We can do various things while we're waiting. Turn off the predictive wind shear. Uh, what else can we do? Turn off the crew oxygen there. We don't need that anymore. 
the ADIS system can be turned back off. The various things around the cockpit can be... Oh, we didn't put the seatbelt sign back on, did we, on approach? That was a bit naughty. Again, we had no passengers, though, remember, so we're telling nobody to sit sit or stand up. Uh, nose light is off, nav lights. Have we got APU yet? Oh, yeah, we've got the APU now. So once you've got the APU, you can turn off the engines and not lose any power to anything. So oh, I have to do this on the controller. So then you'll see the engines spool down. Okay, so now the engines are off, the beacon light can come off, the nav lights off, and I think we're pretty much there. So the emergency exit lights can come back off, or disarmed, and finally APU can come off, and once you're cold and dark you can just turn the batteries off. But obviously in the real procedures you would obviously before completely going cold and dark you'd go and fetch the um the trucks so let's see what this does baggage truck uh jet bridge i, I guess that amber means it's requested the jet bridge but it may not have happened yet so we've got safety cones We've got the baggage truck coming out. The cargo doors have opened. What else can we have? Catering truck. On the after door. Oh no, is somebody going to burn the cakes? Is that why there's a fire engine? And oh dear. The, chair, the stairs have had the catering people run into them. They kind of fight over the aircraft. Anyway, this is the free A330. Before we go on about the quality of some of these things not quite lining up, this is a free aircraft. And it's still in development. And it will probably always be in development, but for free you can't really argue, can you? It's very good. Right. I'm going to leave it there. Hopefully you've enjoyed that, you know, despite all the various little bugs here and there. And I'll see you again soon. Okay, take care.